This is a video response to the skeptical heretic concerning his ongoing debate with a YouTuber by the name of Hey Ruka on the topic of race. The skeptical heretic first starts out his video by apparently implying that Fringe Elements is some sort of magic white nationalist puppet master who has minions all around YouTube whom he uses as mouthpieces. He implies that the user Hey Ruka is allegedly one of these mouthpieces. I do advocate for a, uh, a nationalist society for every racial and ethnic group, separate. Furthermore, a lot of your statements on this topic have been about white nationalism. Where have we heard this before? When I was a white nationalist, I simply believed that the races were best off being separated, and for the most part, I still think that. I just don't prescribe it like I used to. Um, Instead, he has impressionable people like you do it for him. I have been advised by my superiors, that is, um, YouTube users who are a little more familiar with this topic, to present <sighs> sources. Now, sources or not, if you're taking hints from Fringe, you're gonna get smacked around. He's a kid who stopped reading the relevant sources and put his personal bias into absolutely every video he makes, regardless of whether the content is factual or not. Keep in mind that the skeptical heretic gives no evidence for this other than the fact that there are common themes in the subject matter that both Fringe Elements and Heruka talk about. What the skeptical heretic is doing here is a well-known fallacy and rhetorical device known as poisoning the well. He first presents negative information about his target and her alleged associates. He implies that she is gullible, a puppet, and is taking information from a biased and discredited source. The skeptical heretic says this about Heruka in order to discredit or draw scorn to her propositions she puts forward, in order to get his audience to adopt the implicit and biased conclusion that any claim she makes cannot be trusted. However, the fallacy in the skeptical heretic statement comes from the fact that Heruka's online associations, character, and intellectual traits have nothing to do with the truth or falsity of what she says. If a gullible, immoral retard says, if I drop an apple, it will fall down, his or her personal traits obviously do not make such a statement implicitly false or untrustworthy. The same is also true with Heruka. Putting that issue aside for a moment, the idea that there is some ongoing conspiracy with fringe elements here seems very far-fetched to say the least. Heruka did mention that she did take advice from her, quote, superiors, that's plural, whom she never mentioned by name. However, the only people she had featured at the time uh, was Mr. Hair IQ and the Epicurean Atheist. So we have very little prima facie evidence which would warrant the suspicion that fringe elements was involved. Moreover, the only justification for this conspiracy the skeptical heretic provides is that they use similar rhetoric. However, there are hundreds of thousands of white nationalists throughout the world, with a diverse cross-section on YouTube. Nearly all of these people use rhetoric that is similar to a degree, so this is not good evidence of some particular white nationalist conspiracy. I did say that uh, race and IQ are correlated. I also said that IQ isn't everything. Um, you also said it was of premier importance and that it was descriptive of how someone will wind up in life. At no point in her video do I ever recall hearing Heruka say explicitly that IQ is descriptive of how an individual, a single individual, will wind up in life. Heruka talked a lot about how IQ is strongly correlated with the tendency of groups to commit violence, and with life success, that is to say, educational achievement and job success and income levels. Heruka talked about social averages. Averages permit a wide variety of individual variation. For instance, if I take an upper division course in theoretical physics, a course which I admit I am nowhere near qualified to do, and if the class's grade point average is a B plus, does that mean I will get a B plus on my semester grade sheet? No, of course not. A B plus is a general reflection of things true of that group of students, 
but not true necessarily of me as an individual, as I assure you I would fail such a course. Even though Heiruka did a poor job on sourcing what she said, she is nevertheless largely correct. As already mentioned by the user SpockTalk, a study by the social scientist Charles Murray, which looked at the relationship between income and IQ, showed that it was very important for populations. Murray did a longitudinal study that followed a large sample of 5,863 individuals from 1978 until 1971. He categorized his sample into five distinct groups, based on their IQ score range. Very bright people had an IQ of greater than 125. Bright people had an IQ between 124 and 110. Normal people had IQs between 109 and 90. Dull people had an IQ between 89 and 75. And very dull people had an IQ of less than 75. Murray then compared the mean annual income for each of these five groups and his data showed a rather striking correlation between IQ and income. Murray found that the very bright demographic had an average income of $35,000 a year, followed by brights with an average of $26,500, followed by normals with an income of $20,000, with dulls at $14,000 and very dulls at $7,500. To highlight the importance of IQ, According to a 1995 report by the American Psychological Association on the relationship between job performance and IQ, found that through meta-analysis, the correlation between job performance and IQ was 0.54, a strong correlation. The AMA study also put the correlation between IQ scores and the grade point average at about 0.5, which is yet another strong correlation. The same study also found that major IQ tests and other G-loaded tests often used by schools, employers, and the armed forces are very accurate career and academic success or failure predictors for native-born English-speaking Americans. Lastly, to highlight the importance of IQ, we can look at the issue of crime. If we look at the research of Arthur Jensen, cited in his book The G-Factor, we can see that Denson's data shows that regardless of race, people with an IQ range between 70 and 90 have cri higher crime rates than people with IQs lower or above this range, with the range peaking between 80 and 90. Thus, when we look at the research concerning IQ, we can see that it is matter-of-factly the case that it does significantly affect many, though not all, social outcomes for populations. Unfortunately for you, my dear, you haven't done the research and you haven't been paying attention. Now, in my last video I erroneously called this the Nisbet argument and unfortunately Nisbet is the one who provides the refutation. The argument comes from a book called The Bell Curve which unfortunately has been seen as one of the greatest pieces of masturbation when it comes to scientific racism. In order to uh, address this allow me to not only put a link below for the Richard Nisbet article on this, but let me read you his conclusion. First of all, the book known as The Bell Curve by Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein is not the only book, nor the only study, nor the only set of arguments for the existence of a race and IQ cap. Nor was it the case that the known existence of the race and IQ gap originated from either Charles Murray or Richard Herrnstein. Furthermore, in the very Nisbet study the Skeptical Heretic cites, it explicitly states the bell curve was not the first study detailing the race and IQ gap. The Skeptical Heretic would understand this if he had accurately read the very Nisbet article he cited. It seems that either the Skeptical Heretic is lying about the issue, or he's totally ignorant of the history of the issue and his own sources. The following are Nisbet's word from the paper linked by the skeptical heretic himself. Quote, the question of whether IQ differences between blacks and whites have a genetic basis goes at back at least a thousand years to the times when the Moors invaded Europe. The Moors speculated that Europeans might be incapable of abstract thoughts. But by the 19th century, most Europeans probably believed that they were congenially superior to Africans in intellectual skills. The IQ test developed by in the early 20th century reinforced this view since whites scored higher than blacks. Northern Europeans also outscored southern and eastern Europeans as well as Jews. 
Many psychologists assume that these group differences were genetic in origin. End quote. Secondly, the skeptical heretic yet again commits the fallacy of poisoning the well when he describes the bell curve, a book that merely describes a number of pre-established scientific facts on intelligence, IQ, and race and IQ as, quote, one of the greatest pieces of masturbation when it comes to scientific racism. Statements such as these serve no other purpose than to bias the audience against the book and evidence for race and IQ differences. In sum, the most relevant studies provide no evidence for the genetic superiority of either race, but strong evidence for a substantial environmental contribution to the IQ gap between blacks and whites. Almost equally important, rigorous interventions do affect IQ and cognitive skills at every stage of the life course. Moreover, the IQ distance between blacks and whites in the United States has narrowed in recent decades. The evidence thus indicates that if there are genetically determined IQ differences between the races, they are too small to show up with any regularity in studies covering a wide range of populations and using a wide range of methodologies. Nisbet's conclusion, it seems to me, is entirely unhelpful. It is very easy to claim that there is no evidence for something when the very thing you're supposedly measuring is so incredibly vague and nebulous as to not be useful. I don't know what genetic superiority is, nor have I heard of any study proposing how to measure it. In the quote read by the skeptical heretic, Nisbet never attempts to operationally define genetic superiority, nor does he qualify in the quote the very thing that he's denying evidence for. In addition, it only makes sense to call something superior and something else inferior if we are comparing them to each other according to the same metric. Let us operationally define superiority and, in and inferiority in measurable terms so we can try to make some sense out of Nisbet's conclusion. By genetic superiority, suppose we mean the state of affairs when two populations' averages are directly compared to each other by some metric. And it is the case that one population contains factors of inheritance controlling a trait, genes, that result in a numerically greater phenotypic phenomena than the other population. By genetic inferiority, let us suppose we mean the state of affairs when two populations' averages are directly compared to each other by some metric, and it is the case that, that one population has factors of inheritance controlling a trait, genes, that result in a numerically smaller phenotypic phenomena than the other population. If we use this definition, then, as a matter of fact, if we measure several traits between the races, we can see that some races are indeed superior when it comes to some qualities, and other races are inferior when it comes to others. I will give you but a small cross-section of such differences while putting links uh, to the relevant studies in the video description. It is a matter of fact that Asians have bigger brains than whites, who in turn have bigger brains than blacks. Blacks have narrower hips than whites, which allows them to run faster on average, who in turn have narrower hips than Asians. Blacks mature faster than whites, who in turn mature faster than Asians. Furthermore, blacks have between 3 to 19 percent more of the steroid hormone testosterone than whites, and testosterone is strongly correlated with things like aggression, impulsivity, self-esteem, sexual drive, and altruism. Whites, by contrast, have more, more testosterone than Asians. Also, an expression of the MAOA gene is strongly correlated with impulsivity and violence, and has a greater frequency in black populations than in white populations. Furthermore, if we look at the relationship between IQ and brain size, we can see that there are racial differences in brain size. Brain size is a strong correlation of IQ of 0.63. Furthermore, IQ has a heritability between 0.7 to 0.9, although the average quoted by the American Psychological Association is usually put at 0.75. This suggests that most of the causal reasons for IQ levels are largely genetic. Furthermore, the race and IQ gap is highly likely to be due to genetic racial differences, as it still persists when scientists control for income, culture, expectations, and nutrition. Now you seem to think that um, my focus was on skin color, and dude, phenotypical traits are not the cause of IQ 
and they don't determine your race. Okay. You do know what a phenotypical trait is, right? They're the sort of things that govern the various chemical interactions in your body, including the size and shape of your face, the straightness of your hair, the size of your cranial cavity, how your organs function, your immune system. Phenotypical traits are traits that are apparent based on your genotypical expression. You might want to know that before you engage in a conversation about genetics and their influence upon populations of human individuals. Anyone who applies the principle of charity when analyzing arguments, who has any sense, and who looks at the situation with fresh eyes, can easily understand the sense in which Hey Ruka used the sentence, phenotypes don't determine IQ. In one sense of her sentence, phenotypic phenomena like the beating of your heart, the biological functioning of your brain, is obviously, uh, obviously determines IQ in a sense. After all, if your heart stops beating, your IQ essentially becomes zero. However, Heruka seemed to imply that many, although not all, phenotypes, such as physical height, IQ, skull size, hip size, testosterone levels, are mainly determined by genetic factors and not by environment. And this is true. I didn't say that race is akin to skin color. What I did say was that race can better be understood as breeds within a species. Do you understand why that isn't a functional distinction with human beings? I mean, you and all these other stupid racists like to sit down and talk about how humans are not different from other animals. Well, we certainly are. And there's one way in which we're quite different from most other animals. We're able to survive in a wide range of climates very simply because we have higher rationale and intelligence that allows us to problem solve. These have allowed us to trek across the globe. There's a vast multitude of individuals on this planet. I know you're big on individualism, but perhaps we can get into that another time. The reality here is we're not divided up into breeds like dogs or other animals. Race is actually a reasonable distinction when you look at animals. And the reason why is because the majority of them are constrained by geography. We are not. You get that, right? You understand that? First of all, Heiruka never said at any point that human beings aren't different from other animals. This is a complete straw man of what she said. Secondly, the notion that the biological concept of breeds is not a useful taxonomy for human beings due to the fact that humans are not currently geographically isolated seems to be a complete non sequitur. If you go to a puppy mill that breeds large numbers of different purebred puppies and keeps them in pens right next to each other, these different breeds cease to become geographically isolated but it is still useful to categorize the dogs into different breeds because different things are true of them. The same is true with categories of humans. Just because groups of blacks, Asians, and whites uh, live in the same geographical locale, it does not follow that thinking of them as breeds wouldn't be a useful biological category. Lastly, by looking at some modern research, we can see that categorizing different groups into breeds or races of humans is a very useful biological category with a strong backing in science. There are very good evidence for bundles of genetic markers accurately corresponding to self-reported racial categories. To quote one good study published in the American Journal of Human Genetics on the genetic structure of self-identified race slash ethnicity and the confounding in case control association studies, quote, numerous recent studies using a variety of genetic markers have shown that individuals sampled worldwide fall into clusters that roughly correspond to continental lines as well as to commonly used self-identifying racial groups Africans, Europeans, West Asians, East Asians, Pacific Islanders, and Native Americans. Subjects identified themselves as belonging to one of four major racial slash ethnic groups white, African American, East Asian, and Hispanic and were recruited from 15 different geographic locales within the United States and Taiwan. Genetic cluster analysis of the microsatellite markers produced four major clusters, which showed a near-perfect correspondence with the four self-reported race-slash-ethnicity categories. 
there is a wide variance in genetic attributes that human beings have. A lot of them result in disease. And in the comments section of my video, which was a response to your, honestly, it was a piece of crap. And I told you I was going easy on you, but the gloves are off, kiddo. A lot of people talked about Tay-Sachs and sickle cell anemia and various diseases of geographically isolated populations that were primarily a thing of genetic legacy. Do you know why these are focused within different communities? There are phenomenal studies going on nowadays that talk about geographical isolation in human groups, especially groups like the uh, Papua New Guinea tribes, which speak a multitude of different languages, some within a mile of each other. And the reason why is because it's very hard to trek across that sort of land. And so one tribe a mile away from another will be genetically dis uh, disparate. One will be subject to Kuru, the other won't. Partially that's due to the con uh, consumption of human flesh. But there are genetic-based factors that happen over a long term, especially in populations that are somewhat culturally incestuous, like the Akhenazim Jews were long, long ago. And that's why we see things like Tay-Sachs, because these recessive genetic, let's say, deviations from the norm are concentrated in these populations, either socially or geographically, and that's why they come out with these differences. I don't know what the skeptical heretic's point in saying this is. What he says seems to be construed as some sort of attempted argument, either against Hey Ruka or his commenters, but it seems to be just a giant red herring. Regardless of why he talks about a, a few of the causes of differences in racial averages for genetic disease resistance uh, doesn't really seem to help him prove his case that phenotypic racial differences aren't real, substantive, and largely genetic in origin. Before I respond to the skeptical heretic's point, let me first note that I am assuming that every sane individual watching this video believes in Darwinian evolution and rejects any sort of young earth creationism as nonsensical pseudoscience. If we accept this, the evidence shows that anatomically modern humans immigrated out of Africa between 60,000 to 125,000 years ago. We know that the diversity of life, including, including human life, occurs through evolution. Human beings evolved in radically different environments, with radically different environmental pressures, ranging from deserts, rainforests, savannas, steeps, to grassland, tundra, and polar ice caps, and everything in between. These human populations evolved in relative isolation for many tens of thousands of years. We know that human beings reproduce with variation. Natural selection only allows, in the long run, for the existence of individuals whose inherited traits allow them to both adapt to their environment as well as to have offspring who are able to survive and reproduce. Thus, we would expect, over time, human populations would develop different frequencies of different alleles in response to environmental pressures, resulting in phenotypes for some human populations being different in character to other human populations. We can create useful categories for groups of people based on their particular genotypic differences which are largely the result of a shared evolutionary history and lineage. This gives certain populations a multiplicity of phenotypes, and we call these different populations races. There was recently a phenomenal study done on the populations of Europe to see different genetic markers and see if they held to uh, national boundaries. And it was found that they do. Why is that? Why does that work in Europe, but not in the U.S.? Part of the reason is the long history of state warfare, where the Germans... To postulate that the only reason that there are genetic markers within European populations because of a general lack of gene flow is kind of like saying the price of some art is high only because demand for that art is high. In that example, strong demand for art could certainly be a reason the price for art is high, but it is certainly not the reason, as there are other factors such as supply that affect the price. 
so too do the causes of variation among genetic markers between different subgroups of Europeans lay in other factors. These include genetic drift, mutations, as well as natural selection functioning in a mildly differentiated European environment. When, combined with, when all these factors are combined with gene flow, together they do explain the difference. Moreover, what does this issue have to do with anything? This just appears to be another giant red herring. But you would know that if you looked into this, and it's enraging that you haven't. There's a wealth of information on this, and all of this information goes to point to people like Fringe Elements, who you've obviously been taking some of your kicks and cues from, and show that you two are nothing but a bunch of morons. I mean, how can I put it any more simply? Start with an open mind. Do you think that just because you made it as far as atheism that you have an open mind? Not necessarily. Start with a perspective that is contrary to your own. Uh, that's the whole point. Try to prove yourself wrong, not confirm what you already believe. And get a fucking library card. You throw around ad hominems and conspiracy charges like a kid eats M&Ms, and you haven't even looked into the content of your own sources. Ever hear the phrase, People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. I suggest taking to heart uh, your own advice and buying a fucking library card.